We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 right here. So if you guys remember last time we were in this chapter, uh, Manny did about 11 through 18. So we had ended right there at 18 with that verse. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So kind of cover really quick what Manny went through. Um, And obviously Manny had to go through a lot of stuff in a very short amount of time. But what Manny did cover is is this this idea that's contained right here in these verses. So Paul reminds these, especially these Gentile Christians, a lot of them being Gentiles, right? Um, what, What Christ has done, not only to reconcile them to God, which is the great truth that hits right there in verses 1 through 8, but now in 11 to 21, he's going to tell them about this reconciliation. Now, because there's a reconciliation between God and God, and men, that now there can be a reconciliation between men and men. And so that was his, that was his whole idea that he, un, that he unpacked. And it was displayed in this great example of how the Gentiles before faith were without hope, they were without God in the world, and it's because they were not heirs of the promise. They, they, they were not heirs of the, the, the covenants of promise, as it says. And so they were ignorant of the promises of God. They were ignorant of the blessing of God. And as Paul calls them, they were strangers and aliens to God's people. They were outsiders. But now, as Paul says, as Manny taught last time, right? The reason for that gap between Jew and Gentile is because there was a wall, as he says right here, A wall of hostility. That wall of hostility being built up by the law of commandments expressed in ordinances in the Old Covenant. And what did they do? They separated God's people from the world. They separated Jew from Gentile. And Paul's big declaration in here, which we'll kind of get to a little bit today. We'll kind of rehash this idea a little bit more than many had time for. But brethren, is that that whole Old Covenant, the whole Old World is gone. And that doesn't strike us like it ought to, but that thing is gone. It's been put away. It's been made uh, invalid. It has been nullified. So the thing that once created separation between God's people and the rest of mankind has now been done away with. And that's a big amen for us. Because now we all sit in this room as beneficiaries of this exact promise from 2,000 years ago. And so the result then, brethren, is this. You now have access in one spirit to the Father. So we have peace. We have peace. We have peace with God. And probably just as important as Manny emphasized last week, we have peace with one another. And amen to that. So what I want to focus on here in these last couple of verses in 19 through 22 is going to be this. Paul is really going to say very similar things to what he's already said now. He's going to do it with some different language right here. And he's going to start getting what I would call metaphors to describe the reality that he's just painted in this section. But what he's going to do here in these final verses is he's going to say, here, because of what God has done in Christ to reconcile you to God and reconcile one another, you Jew and Gentile together, there is now, there, there is now a result that happens because of this reconciliation. Something actually changes. It's almost like God declares something, God acts on behalf of His people, and now reality actually changes. There is a result that takes about, if God makes Jew and Gentile, and He makes peace between them, well, brethren, that means that everything's got to change. He makes this declaration in Christ, He preached peace to you, God acts, He spills Christ's blood so that you guys can be brought together. He's done this, but He's also done more than this. God did not just declare us to be in the right. He did not declare us to just have peace. He did not even just act on our behalf by spilling Christ's blood so that we could have reconciliation. Brethren, when God did this, He did all those things, but He also does one more thing that I want you to see this morning. God has also created something in Christ Jesus. This is the result of what Manny preached last time. And I want us to focus on this in the final verses. We're going to look at the result of God making peace between Jew and Gentile. And that's this. God's created something new now. Something completely new. Not only has he made these things happen, something new has come into being. 
And like I kind of alluded to, you may, not, and this is okay. There, there is truths in the Bible that take a lot of time to appreciate and for God to really open up. And hopefully this morning, it might be a beginning for some of you. For some of you, these truths won't be any new. But brethren, listen, we don't want to come to these truths, whether we've heard them before or haven't heard them before, and not ask God to give us fresh eyes towards this truth to realize, brethren, what has happened and what Paul is going to describe here is something that is so profound theologically and historically as it relates to the reality and the fabric of the universe itself, brethren, that we may not even comprehend it all this morning. But I want to show us at least, and Lord would help us to see and understand just how grand of a thing God has created by now breaking down the wall of hostility and bringing Jew and Gentile together. So we're going to have two points for today. So since Christ has died, right? Since Christ has died, shed his blood, he's brought down the wall of hostility which separated Jew and Gentile. God has now created two things. And these two things are very interconnected, but they are two different things. Here's our two points. God has therefore created one. He's created a new man in Christ. And then second, God has therefore created a new temple in Christ. And both of these are the results of God's actions of what Manny preached. Because blood's been spilt, because the wall of hostility has been broken down, because Jew and Gentile now have access to the Father by one spirit, what does Paul begin here in 19? So then, and concludes with this reality of what God has now created. So those two things, God has created a new man in Christ, God has created a new temple in Christ, and this is all the result of God's action. God has created here again. It's like you get a little Genesis right here, and we're going to be in Genesis too. So let's get into these two points because we have a lot jammed into these two points that we need to get through. Now, I'm cheating a little bit. I am doing 19 through 22, but I, I could not pass this, this, this piece up. I'm going to be stealing a little bit from 14, 15, and 16, but it'll make our point in 19 through 22. So don't be like, I thought we were already did these verses. We did, but Manny can't cover everything in these verses. So here's our first point. Because Christ has done all these things, God has therefore created a new man in Christ. So let's look back at verses 14 through 16. So verses 14 through 16, here's what Paul said previously. He says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Now he's talking about Jew and Gentile. So that he might create in himself, and here's our phrase, so that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So I, I want to just notice what the text says on the surface, because sometimes when you do any kind of study of the Bible, there, there's this really, there's this tendency to try to dig so deep, you just miss what it says right there on the verse and just try to get a, a basic understanding of, okay, what's this text saying? And then we can maybe go through and kind of parse out some of these, um, the, the, these harder sections or, or these more difficult words. So let's just look right on, on the surface about what it says, right? Okay, because Christ has done this thing that he says there in 14, he has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Now, there's a really interesting play on an idea here, and it's this idea of flesh. So notice how he puts this, right? He himself is our peace who has made us both one and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Well, what was the dividing wall of hostility? What was the actual sign of this dividing wall being up that he talks about earlier? Well, in 11, he says, Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles, what? In the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the, un by the circumcision, which is made in the flesh, 
So you get this really funny play on words. Now, now Paul is saying, hey, listen, Christ has broken down this fleshly wall, which would be circumcision, this identifying marker between Jew and non-Jew. How did Christ break down the fleshly wall? He broke it down in his own flesh, is what it says, right? That's how he did it. He says, he has broken down in his flesh, meaning his body on the cross, the dividing wall. So you get this really interesting idea. Christ broke down the fleshly wall in his own flesh, and he has created now a new what in him? A new flesh, right? So this is really funny. What used to mark out the people of God was an actual mark on the body to identify the body. And now Christ comes along, and he puts his own flesh on the cross, and he breaks down that wall of that fleshly wall, and now he creates this new flesh, this new body. So it's a very interesting play on uh, word that uh, Paul does here. But so just right on the surface then, this is what Christ has done. He has broken down this wall of hostility in his flesh in order to do what? What does it just say right there on the text? That, right, your purpose clause, that he might create in himself what? One new man in the place of two. That was the purpose. So this act has decisively then, according to Paul, it has decisively created something new. This is not just a declaration that Paul is making. He's saying this act of Jesus going to the cross and, and cutting of his own flesh has now put away the old and actually created a new one, a new body, a new flesh. And so the question for you should be, what did Christ create? Right? If, if it says he created something, well, it says he created a new man, right? Or as he says just in the next line, he says one new man and then one body, right? He created in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace might reconcile us both to God in one body. So to be a new man, then, is to, is to be a new body. It means to be a, a, a newly remade uh, version of God's people. And so this new man or this new body now is, is something that is concrete. It's in reality. It's a new entity. It's a new thing that has actually been born into existence. So then when Christ, when he brings Jew and Gentile together, brethren, what he actually does in doing those things is he actually creates something new. I mean, that's just what the text says. There is now really one new man in the place of two where there was formerly a real fleshly dividing wall between Jew and Gentile, that has now been done away with, but a real new entity has now come into its place. And so now that Jew and Gentile are no longer divided, God looks down. He really does. He looks down. Instead of seeing two, what does he see? He sees one, right? God looks down, and he doesn't see two distinct things anymore. He doesn't say, Jews over here, Christians over here, Jews over here, Gentiles over here. He looks down, and if you're in Christ, what does he see? One new man. He sees one body of people. Not two distinct bodies, not two distinct things, not two distinct entities. He sees one, the new man, singular, the new body, all in Christ. And this is what Christ has created. And that's just on the surface of the text. But this is not only what Christ has done, uh, brethren, what, what he's done, but what Christ can do, right? So God, Christ didn't just accomplish this thing. It's not just something he kind of did out there. This is something that Christ had the authority to do for a particular reason. And he says it in that text himself. So back there in verses 14 through 16, it says that he might create in who? in himself one new man in place of the two and that's an important phrase and many talked about this last time christ didn't come and just establish peace with some other thing outside of himself he himself is our peace well and just as he himself is our peace between jew and gentile he himself is now the joiner of this one new body because he himself brethren this is going to be important he himself is the new man christ himself is the new body. Or we could say it in a, a, a biblical way that Paul says in Romans or in Corinthians, Jesus is the new Adam, right? What does Adam's name mean? Man, right? Jesus himself is this new man. So this isn't just something Christ done outside of himself. It says 
He created this one new man in himself. So Jesus has authority to do that because he himself is the new man and he's creating this new man by joining two distinct groups of people now together in himself. And so because he's formed this new man, brethren, this new body, or as I'll keep repeating throughout this sermon, this new Adam, he's formed it, brethren, to himself, his very own body. Why? Why can he do that? Because Jesus Christ himself is the new Adam. He is the new man. And brethren, there is this intimate and vital connection that we have with Christ then as part of his body, as part of being this new man. And I want to show you something here because I think we'd miss out on this idea if we didn't really take a look at it. So this idea of, of Jesus being himself this new man, and now you, as part of his body, are now called the new man, the one new body. This idea itself is not new, it is old, but the reality is new. So I want to show you this. So you guys can keep your finger right here in Genesis 2. We're going to go back to my favorite. We're going to Genesis. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2, and then we'll kind of trek our way through a few verses right here. So all the way back in Genesis 1 and 2, like let's get a very brief recap because we don't need to spend a lot of time here, right? God creates Adam, right? The man, right? That, that, that's who Adam is. He's the man. Not anymore. Christ is the man, but you know what I'm saying, right? Adam is the man at this point in time, <laughs> Right? And what is Adam's role and function as the man over creation? Well, he's your representative. We read about this in Romans 5, right? In Adam all die, and in Christ all are made alive. So Adam stands as this representative then of all of mankind. And what would have happened had Adam obeyed? Well, through Adam and through his children, his seed, right? The world would have been covered with the glory of the Lord as the, uh, as the water covers the sea, right? That's what would have happened. And because of that, then, what you would have over the whole face of the earth is worshipers. That's what it means for God's glory to be covered over the face of the earth, is that people over the whole face of the earth worship God. And if Adam had obeyed and he had represented of all of mankind, this would have been accomplished. This would have been something he, he would have enjoyed, and these people would have worshipped and then enjoyed God forever. And yet we know, brethren, Adam fails to do this kind of thing. He's cast out of the garden, and now Adam is no longer the man. At least he's not the man for God. He's not, he's not God's son anymore in the sense of having a right relationship. Now, when Adam gets thrown out of the garden, he gets thrown out of the garden because now he's what? Well, he's like what Paul says of the Ephesian Gentiles. Adam just became a stranger and an exile and an alien to God's presence. That's why he has to go. He can't stay. You have to be a son. You have to be a man in right standing or you're a stranger and an alien to God. And you got to be exiled. You got to go. And that's what happens to Adam. And obviously, if you didn't read past Genesis chapter 3, you would think then the rest is all toast. It's all going to go bad. But we know that's not the case. We know of this promise here in Genesis chapter 3 that this would not remain the case. So let's read this really quick because we're going to get our first clue here to this idea of this man that we're looking for, this new man, this new Adam that we're looking for. So Genesis 3.15 says, God speaking, I will put enmity between you and the woman. So he's speaking to the serpent and he's saying, serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your, speaking of the serpent, your seed and her seed. And then here's the result. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So you get your tip off right there. This seed of the woman is going to be what in gender? Male. This is a he will. This seed of the woman is going to be a male. And this is very important because he's going to mimic what Adam didn't do. This is going to be a man. This is going to be a new man. This is going to be a new Adam. And so God promises that this man's going to come. He's going to defeat this serpent. Then what's going to be the implication then, if you think in your mind, what's going to be the implication if he destroys the serpent? Well, he's going to roll back the curse is what he's going to do. He's going to roll back the curse. And you get this hinted at more and more. So let's go here to Genesis chapter 4, right? You get this hinted at here in Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, right? So 
that you're going to get divine commentary about this birth of this son, Cain. And listen to, to what Eve says. She says, I have gotten a man. And the word here would be Adam. I have gotten an Adam. Now that sounds really wooden and rough, so man is better. But just want you to get that idea in your mind. Here's a new man. I have gotten a man with the help of Yahweh, right? So Eve is tracking. She goes, okay, we just heard the promise. He's going to come and do it. There's going to be a new man who's coming. Man, she has Cain and she's already tracking with the promise. But brethren, is it Cain? No. Who is Cain's seed of? Seed of the woman or seed of who? Seed of the serpent, right? Because he goes out and he kills and he murders his brother. So we know that even though Cain is described in this way, it's ultimately not Cain. But you see what's being awaited for right there in Cain being called the man that I've gotten with the help of the Lord. She's waiting upon this new man. So you get this later on in Genesis 4. You get the same continuing promise here at the end. You think, man, is it all going to fail then? Cain should have been the guy, kills his brother. What's going to happen? Well, it continues. The, the promise remains. Genesis chapter 4, 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son. Now that's important, a son. And called his name Seth. For, he, for she said, God has appointed for me another seed instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. And to Seth also was born, uh, also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And now look at the result of this. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So right here in this little, like kind of just really small seed form then, in these first four chapters, you have this idea that is just bursting out of the seams in these couple of chapters here, that what is being awaited for since the fall to the coming of Jesus Christ is this awaiting for this new man or this new Adam. And this is going to be the one who comes. He's going to reverse the curse and with what we're going to see in the next couple of uh, verses that we look at throughout the Old Testament, he is going to come and not just reverse the curse, he's going to bring blessing to all the nations, even to Gentiles. He's going to start bringing blessings too. So let's take a look then at these next kind of sections right here. So we get this promise picked up just in the following chapter here now in Genesis 5. So you're going to get this idea, like I said, it's littered all throughout here, the Old Testament. So this is Genesis chapter 5, 28 through 29. Now when Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, so here's a description of why, Noah, why, why his name's Noah, right? Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us what? Relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Well, how, how could you put that in maybe a, a simpler, more easier way to understand? Noah's going to come and reverse this curse, right? He's going to come and give them relief because the curse was that they would have to work and it'd be painful, hard labor toil. And he says, oh, Noah, here he is. Here he is. Here's this man now who's going to come. He's going to make this great reversal going here. This has got to be this guy right here. So you get this thing even picture with Noah. And now with Noah, you realize he's not just going to reverse the curse. He's going to bring relief to people. So he's going to bless them. You get this later on in Genesis 12 with Abraham here in Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So now the connection is starting. It's like we get more light as we continue to open up. More light's being shed, and this idea just starts to become clearer. Noah, Abraham, all these guys are being presented as what? New what? These are new Adams. They're these new men figures. So think it. Maybe this is the one who's going to finally bring us relief from the curse. He's going to come in. He's going to destroy that snake. He's going to roll back these curses. He's going to bring blessing us even to all the families of the earth. All the nations are going to get blessed through this seed. And that's how they keep getting presented. That's how they keep uh, getting identified, right? And here's what's important about this promise to Abraham. Now it's not just Abraham who does this, but now Abraham's name is to be proclaimed in such a way that 
If Abraham blesses you and you identify with Abraham, what happens to you? Blessed, right? If Abraham blesses you and you are willing to identify yourself with him, blessed. You stand opposed to Abraham and his seed and, you, and he does not bless you, you're cursed. So this is really interesting then because now you start to get this other idea too that we're going to see as it unfolds is that this new man or this new Adam at times is going to get interplayed with either one person as a singular representative, right? As, as kind of like the, the chief head of all heads and sometimes with a group of people, right? So that, you know, um, at, at a particular time in scripture, they get, so there's the man and then there's a singular man standing right there. But at other times in the Bible, the Bible can say the man, but it's looking at a big group of people but it's viewing them as one whole, as one entity, even though there's many people like that. And we're going to start to see this kind of thing get developed, where there's one singular representative and there's a group as a whole that gets identified with that representative. And sometimes they even get the representative's titles. So let's look at this one in Exodus. We're going to get this, this, this contrast right here in Exodus chapter 1. So Exodus 1, beginning here in verse 1, says, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. And then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. But, so even though Joseph dies, there's good news. But the people of Israel were what? Were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now, pause right there for a second. Where have you heard that kind of language before of fruitful and multiply and filling up the land or the earth? Yeah, in Genesis. And who else is that given to? It's not just Adam in Genesis. Who, who comes a little bit afterwards in chapter 5, chapter 6? Noah, right? It's, it's spoken of to Noah as well. And then you get that idea even there with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But notice here, now it's not speaking of one person as their task. It looks at this group. And it, and it looks at this group as if they're the singular representative, right? Because those commands were originally given to one person. Now through their children, they would obey that command, but it was given to one person. But now you see this group of people, Israel, God's people, acting as one man, fulfilling this great thing. They're being fruitful. They're multiplying. They are filling up the land. So there you get this group concept, this group idea. But then right here in Exodus chapter 2, Moses is going to be very particular now to snatch out one representative from the people to make him the representative of the people. So Genesis chapter, excuse me, Exodus chapter 2, beginning here in verse 1. Now, once again, I'm going to slow down and emphasize a couple of words so that I'm really kind of hitting on the point right here at the beginning, verse one. Now a man, right? That's the same word back there in Genesis. There's this Adam figure. Now a man from the house of Levi went, and what does he do? And took as his wife a Levite woman, and the woman conceived and bore a son. Wow, if you bear a son, this is good news, especially if you're called a man, right? <laughs> if you're an Adam figure and you bear a son, this means good things. This could be the one, right? So look back there, the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes and dabbed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. Now there's a lot that can be said about that section too. But right here, the whole point of this story, the whole point of that opening in Exodus 2 is, here the people are doing the work that's been given and tasked to one man. And now the people themselves are doing it as if they're functioning as the one man. And then in Exodus 2, you get one of them plucked out. And why the attention to a little baby being left by their mother and then having to be hidden and going down the river? Why the, why the necessary detail? That just seems so unnecessary for a reason to tell you, hey, this little one that just got put in this mini ark, like Noah was in an ark, this little mini ark, this one is important. And as you're going to find out later, he ends up representing the whole nation. 
Moses ends up being a representative for the people, right? You think of Moses interceding before the Lord and he can intercede for the people. Why? Because he represents them. If he stands before God, he can stand before God as all of Israel. And when all of Israel needs some help, that one man can stand in the place for all of Israel. Now here, a few chapters later in Exodus, the, I mean, like I said, this connection just keeps getting stronger. The people, the sons, the men are viewed as doing the singular work of a man. And then here in chapter 4, you finally get this explicit declaration of God speaking of a group as one. Almost like as we talk about the church, right? We don't say all you church people. <laughs> we say the church. And you know that I'm addressing all of you in here, even though I'm addressing us singularly as the church. So notice what Moses says here in Exodus chapter 4, verse 21. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. And then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my, <clears throat> excuse me, what? Firstborn son. Singular, not sons. Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Now, how important is that idea right there? Right? He looks at all of Israel and says one, and he just thinks of them as one individual, God's collective son, the one son. And then he tells Pharaoh, if you don't do what I'm asking... I'm going to take your son. And yes, does he take Pharaoh's actual son? Yes, Paul, but he does more than that. He takes all of Pharaoh's or fails. <laughs> he takes all of Pharaoh's firstborn males, all the seed of the serpent, and he crushes all of them. I mean, the, the idea cannot be any stronger, brethren. There is these sons of Israel viewed as one son, and there's these sons of the devil, these sons of Pharaoh viewed as one son. And you're either going to let one go or he's going to crush the head of another one. And then you get this idea picked up later on in Deuteronomy. This is really important here in Deuteronomy. Because you know, you know, you know, one of the most, you know what the most repetitive command in Deuteronomy is? If anyone could take a guess. You're constantly supposed to teach what to who. Yes, children. Let's, let's use a, that's our modern translations, unfortunately. It should say seed. But children, offspring, means your male heirs. This is why, all, you, I mean, just go read the first six chapters of Deuteronomy and you'll believe me. Trust me. It is, make sure that as you learn this law, you don't forget it and you teach your sons. And when you're along the way, don't forget to teach your sons. And when your sons ask you, Dad, why did God do this for you? You tell your son, why the emphasis with the son? Well, you get that same idea right here because Israel as a whole is God's son and they need to be obedient as a son. So the sons all need to be obedient. And yet right here in Deuteronomy, you get this brief focus then back on one particular son when Moses begins to prophesy about this coming king here in Deuteronomy. Um, <clears throat> I think this is Deuteronomy 17. I think I put the, uh, um, I think I put my reference down incorrectly. Let me just double check because I don't want to have the incorrect one. Yeah. This is going to be Deuteronomy 17. So Deuteronomy 17, going to begin here at verse 14. And then I'm going to go 14, 15, and then skip over to 18. So Deuteronomy 17, When you come to the land that your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up against his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children and Israel." Now, that also sounds a lot like what? Psalm 1, right? The blessed man, he meditates on God's law day and night, and then he's successful in all he does. Well, here, Deuteronomy is looking at all these sons, and he's saying, hey, one day you're going to want one son over you, a king, true king. Here's what he's going to have to do. He's going to have to have this law before him. He's going to have to meditate on it day and night. He's going to have to learn to fear Yahweh so that 
his people would be blessed. So once again, you get this jump in. It's just all the time. The Bible will just do this. And it doesn't warn you because we got to become better readers of the Bible. The Bible is already really good and perfect at explaining a story. But it'll just jump back and forth. The one, the many. The one, the many. The one, the many. And sometimes you just got to pay attention to go, okay, we just went from both. Why? Well, brother, we know. All the way back from the beginning, we know why. This is something that goes all the way back to Genesis. David himself recognizes this when he becomes king. So let me give you two distinct psalms where I think David is looking back on all this scripture that he would have had. He would have been meditating upon the law day and night. He would have been reading Torah. He would have been reading Deuteronomy as the king. And he would have been recognizing, oh my goodness, I see what's going on here. And here's two Psalms to prove to you that I think David is recognizing this and picking this up in his own thought. So this is Psalm 2, going to begin at the end of Psalm 2 and verse 10. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned. O rulers of the earth, serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Now, this last verse is important. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. So I think David himself recognizes the truth that we just talked about, the one and the many. David himself is this king here in Psalm 2. Right? David recognizes that unless you fear Yahweh and kiss me, meaning you bow down to me, you give allegiance to me, God's wrath will be poured out on you. But all who take refuge in the king, what are they? Oh, they become blessed. They become blessed just like David. It's like they share in his blessing by what? Identifying themselves with David just like you would identify yourself with Abraham, just like you would have to identify with Noah, just like you were identified in Adam. So I think David sees it here, and then David sees it here as well in Psalm 8. I'm going to begin here at verse 3. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you've set in place. Now listen, once again, I'm going to emphasize the word on purpose. What is man, right? You could translate this Adam. What is Adam that you are mindful of him, or the son of Adam that you care for him? Now the question for you is, who wrote this psalm? David wrote this psalm. So, I think David is, is thinking about himself in terms of the promise from Adam that one's going to come and he's going to uh, be the seed of the woman to come to crush the serpent's head and he's going to rule and do all these things. Because he says, he, he brings up Adam here, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of Adam that you care for him? And I think David here is thinking about 2 Samuel 7, that he's a son and he's going to give him a son. And these, this is going to be a son that's going to be a ruler. He's going to come and sit upon a throne. And here's why I think he's got this in mind. Look what he says right after that. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. And here's what he's done for him. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, sheep, oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. Does that not sound like a new Adam figure? You have given this son of Adam dominion over everything, and David has in mind himself. What am I? This son of Adam that you would consider me, and yet you've given me all this rule and all this dominion over all things. And so, brethren, you see that the, that the Old Testament is picking up on this pattern, and it's growing it, and it's growing it, and it's growing it, and it's growing it, growing it so that ultimately... This gets displayed and we see this in Jesus. We see this as, as the Lord Jesus Christ himself comes. And Paul, he goes on and he starts stating this everywhere. He goes off and says it in Romans. He says it in 1 Corinthians. And he's alluding it to here in Ephesians chapter 2 with this language of this new man. Now Jesus himself, and this is why I like how he says it in Romans. The, I think it's Romans. I always get confused where he says it this way. The last Adam, right? Sometimes we refer to Jesus as the second Adam, but I think it's a little better to say the last because he's the last in a train of like types and shadows and, and all of these um, pictures of what he's going to be like. But Jesus really is the ultimate one. Jesus is this last new, final, glorious man who is going to do all that God promised and yet he's going to be without sin. And this is how Paul can then state here, brethren, all the way back as we now come right back here to Ephesians chapter 2. Christ then... How can Christ 
bring Jew and Gentile, how, what authority does he have to say one new one? Because he is the new man. He has the authority because he himself is the head. He is that new man. He is the head of that new body. He has all right and prerogative to join to himself whomever he desires to join to himself because he is our new head. And this is how Paul can state such a reality took place when Jesus broke down the old wall of hostility and by uniting Jew and Gentile together. Because Jesus himself is the fulfillment then of this new man. Which is why then, brethren, if you do the same thing that was supposed to be done in the Old Testament, if you identified yourself with the promised man, with the promised seed, you are blessed. That's why he can say, I mean, this is such a radical thing for him to say about you as Gentiles. One new man, one new Adam. I can look at every single person in here and say, the new man, the new Adam. A title that is actually, it, it's, it's such a crazy thing. Jeez, that's Jesus' title. And then the Bible has no problem with saying the new man, the new body, the new humanity, the, the, the one straight from God himself. Brethren, it's you. You are this new man. And so brethren, as you look around and as you think about that, then we can go, well, something real actually has come about. Something really did change. Reality really was changed because look at us in this room right now. Christ really did unite a people together into one new man, the new Adam, the new humanity, the redeemed humanity of God. This is something he really did. And brother, and this is the, and this is the whole reason with why Jew and Gentile can be brought together because we really did need a head to bring us together. God couldn't just look at the Jew and the Gentile and just say, eh, forget all the past stuff. Wham, let's just smash you guys together and put some glue on it. No, no, no. Something real had to be done, right? The old way had to actually be uh, nullified. Christ really had to die. He really had to become this new man in order to join the two together. And this, brethren, is important for us because it says something, right? And Manny really emphasized this uh, last time, but I want to go beyond just the, the emphasis of now there's no more hostility. Oh, brethren, well, th this, is, this is absolutely true. The hostility is gone. And we can see that in the text. He says there's no more hostility now. But brethren, it says something positive too. It doesn't just say, hey, there's no more hostility now. Well, if there's no more hostility now between Jew and Gentile, there's a reason for that. And the reason is now this. The way that you identify with God and his people has fundamentally changed. And you get Paul talking about this all throughout his epistles, right? If you think circumcision, if you think much about it, it's not going to do you any good. It is not what makes you part of God's people. This is not the mark. This is not the thing anymore. You're looking to the law like they had to back then. What, the, a new era has come. Christ has put that thing away. You want to look to the old marker? It's going to be of no use to you. In fact, it's actually going to be to your detriment. Because now, brethren, the way we identify with Christ and his people is not by some outward mark. No one's got to come in and wear a, you know, a jacket in here to be considered part of God's people. Brother, you don't have to come in here and have you know, something pierced through your ear. You don't have to have the cut of circumcision. Brother, the hostility is gone, yes, but it's more than that. We now have a new way to tell people, here's how you identify with the one true and living God. Here's how you become a part of the new humanity, faith. <laughs> and as Paul says later, it's always been a faith. Faith has always been the thing that marks someone out truly as God's people. And he's bringing us back to this, the reality. One's identification with Christ and Christ, brethren, this is important, a part of our heritage. Christ and Christ alone is the identifying marker for God's people. No longer are there any other distinctions, brethren, that count. You are either in Christ or you are in who? You are in Adam. That is the only distinction made left. It does not matter any longer if you are Jew or Gentile. It does not matter if you are slave or free. It does not matter if you are male or female. We all can and all, all are now one body and one new man if we identify with Christ simply by faith. That's the identifying marker.
Christ, brethren, and this is important, Christ as the head of this new covenant, he determines the markings of this new covenant. And now the determining factor and the determining mark of inclusion is Christ. And here's what he's going to say later there in 19 through 20. Well, how do you know Christ is there building this thing? How do you know he's there? The Spirit. The Spirit is the identifying marker. Shared freely all now to Jew and Gentile. And brethren, this practically, obviously, this means so much more than we could possibly realize. This, you know, this, this means the end of hostility. This means the, the end of distinctions. This means a new and better way of identifying with God, identifying with his people, a way, brethren, that can allow anybody and everybody, which why when we sing, let the nations come, bid them to come, brethren, they can actually come. Because there's a new way. And the way is Christ. And the way is faith. And this is how Paul can say something like 2.19 here in Ephesians. So then, right, his conclusion. So then, as the new man, you are no longer strangers and aliens. But what about circumcision? No longer. You are fellow citizens. Full status with the saints. You yourself are now a saint. Members of the household of God. Brethren, that is a radical statement that Paul can make. And you better believe this is why Paul got so much harassment and even stoned and tried to be beaten and killed for making such claims. That's not how the old world worked, but it's how the new one does. There's a new way of identification, brethren, and all you need to identify with Christ is by faith. But there's more. <laughs> so there's more. He's created this new man. Our second last thing. He's created a new temple. So not only, brethren, are we created into a new man, into a new body, but as Paul closes here in these last couple of verses, he makes emphatic for us, right? Ab absolutely, that what Christ has created in himself is the new temple of God. So let's look at Ephesians 2, 20 to 22. So he's talking about then this, this body, which I had to start right here because... I want you to hear how dr he, his, his use of metaphor is just drastic. <laughs> Paul can do this all the time. Paul's been talking about uh, a new man, a new body, and then he talks about this new man and new body now like it's an architectural structure. All right, so verse 20, he says, built, right? We don't usually speak of people that way. You're built. like We do, but not in that context. You know what I mean? It's a, we don't usually speak of people like that. We speak of buildings. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure. So you see what he just did? He went from body to, 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 to man, this new flesh, now to building, <laughs> now to this new structure. He's going to tell you what kind of structure. Being joined together, this new structure, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Well, that's another way to say temple right there. Brethren, this too right here, this truth is absolutely radical. Because that's not how the old world worked. Paul doesn't just say we're a new man and we're a new body in Christ, but that as the new man and the new body, brethren, we're also a new temple, a new temple structure, one that's being built up by God himself. And guess what this temple comprises of? Not stone and brick, gold and silver. Brethren, it comprises of Jew and Gentile being stacked together now into this new temple. And you need to think back, back now again, like we did kind of in Genesis. We need to think back now to the Old Testament, brethren. The height, the absolute height of Old Covenant worship was the temple. I mean, that was it. You wanted to experience the, at, the, you know, the, the utmost purity of worship, closeness to the presence of God, closeness to the people of God. Brethren, you had to make a trip to the temple. You had to. That was where God dwelt. And the further you were away from that temple, the further you were away from God's presence and God's people and God's blessing. Where this was the height, the tabernacle or their temple. These were the places where, brethren, this was God's house. You think about David asked to build God a temple, and he says, I'm going to build you a what? I'm going to build you a house first. 
and then your son will build a house for me. So I mean, these temple structures, these tabernacles, these temples, the, the, you know, the Solomonic temple, brethren, these are housings for God, even though, as he says later, God doesn't need no house. Well, what, 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 what house can you build for him to contain him? You really can't. But anyway, you see that he said, to be close to God, brethren, you had to draw near to the temple structure. This physical block, block building overlaid with all sorts of different precious jewels and gold. And brethren, listen, not only did you have to do that, but on the reverse, if God departs from that place, that's bad. If God departs from the building, the building becomes nothing. It could be overlaid with million dollar bills. It doesn't mean anything. If God's not there, the house becomes worthless. And as Jesus says, the house becomes desolate. It becomes a desolation like the wilderness. It has no value anymore. So if God draws away from the temple, then you know we're in bad shape and we are under judgment. And brethren, I want us to think about then how the Old Testament was longing for a new temple. Because let me ask you this question. Did that temple structure last in the Old Covenant? Was it successful? Is Solomon's temple still standing, y'all? No, it was not successful. <laughs> it's not standing, not successful. It fell because God left it. His presence left it. It was a dismal failure. So now you have to think, well, if it failed, then where's God's presence? And then where's God's promise is going to come about? What is God going to do to remedy this? Because if there's no temple, then there's no God, there's no blessing, there's no people to receive the blessings, and there's none of those promises to come to pass. You need to think to yourself, man, the temple goes down. We're looking for something then to come up because if the temple's not up, well, this, is bad. this is bad news for everybody, not just Jews. This is bad news for the world if the temple's not standing. So here was the hope then in the Old Testament because they knew this thing failed. Psalm 74. Oh God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke up against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you've redeemed to be the tribe of your heritage. Remember Mount Zion, where you have dwelt. Direct your steps to the perpetual ruins. The enemy has destroyed everything in the sanctuary. Your foes have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They set up their own signs for signs. They were like those who swing axes in a forest of trees. And all its carved wood they broke down with hatchets and hammers. They set your sanctuary on fire. They profaned the dwelling place of your name, bringing it down to the ground. And they said to themselves, we will utterly subdue them. And they burned all the meeting places of God in the land. Brethren, that's extremely bad news in the old world. The meeting places of God are gone. The temple is destroyed. That means there's no worship. That means no promises are coming about. That means there's no king sitting on the throne. There is nothing that looks like is going to come about from God to save his people and ultimately to save the world. But we know, brethren, it does not end like that. <laughs> it never ends in a bad story. I don't care what movies they put out. I don't like the bad endings to a story because it never ends like that. Zechariah, out of many of the prophets, right, he looks forward to a day. He's a prophet, right? He's looking forward to a day when, okay, they know this temple structure got destroyed. We read Psalm 74. There's other texts. But the prophets know because of the promise, because of the promise of a king, there's going to be another temple coming, all right? And he's looking forward to this day when this new one's going to be built. And as Zechariah is going to point out here, this new temple is actually going to be built up not just by Israel, but by Gentiles who are going to come and help build this. So let's look at Zechariah chapter 6. This is one of the Old Testament readings Nick read. And the word of the Lord came to me. Take the exiles from Heldai, Tobijah, and Jedidiah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold. And make a crown, set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Ah, hope. There's going to be another one. This branch is going to come and he's going to build this other temple for us. That's good news for us. The temple's coming back. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord. 
and it shall bear royal honor, and shall sit and rule on his throne. There shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Helam, Tobijah, Jedidiah, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off shall come and help build the temple of the Lord. And you shall know that the Lord of, the ho of hosts has sent me to you, and this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. So notice right here that what you have going on, you have this hope, brethren, of this temple. Oh, man, it's going to get built back up again. This is a good thing. This is good news for God. This is good news for the world. And you even get this little hint right here that this, this temple is not just going to be built up by, by, by just Jews in the land. Gentiles are going to come from far off and help build this place. Notice what he says right there. He says, and those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. Now, Manny pointed this out last week in his text from Isaiah and connected it with Ephesians 2. But if you guys remember back in Ephesians 2 in some of Manny's verses, remember what it said about the Gentiles there in 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are what? Once far off have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. Well, that's good news, because that sounds like Zechariah. Well, what are these who were far off being brought near doing in our text here in 19 through 22? Well, brethren, they're being stacked like stones into a temple. We see what Zechariah is talking about here. He's looking for a temple, and Gentiles are going to come build this thing. So the question becomes, well, this temple that is being built, prophesied, and looked forward to, is it going to be like the old one, right? When, when the prophets are looking for a new temple to be built, are they going, we're looking for the one that looks just like Solomon, give us the exact blueprint, and when it comes, we're golden. That'll be the new temple. Is that what they're looking for? Or are the prophets indicating to us that what's being longed for, what's being hoped for, this new temple of the Lord, it's not going to be like the old one. It's going to be different. And it's, and it's going to be something that's not only different, as in, you know, it's got different things going on. It's going to be bigger and greater and far more glorious than the old one. So here's another text right here in Haggai. Haggai chapter 2. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest and to all the remnant of the people, and say. So here's what he's saying to the people, right? And these are people who have just, they've come back into the land, and they're, re, they're rebuilding the temple, right? So the, the, here, this is important, right? This is, what's, this is what's going on. These people have come back into the land, and they're starting to rebuild the temple. But notice what he's told to speak to the people. He says this to them. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? You imagine he's standing there. Who remembers this house that's getting built up right now? You remember it in its former glory? Some of them would have. Very, very good potential. Some of them would have remembered. How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst, fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, so that the treasure of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. Now listen to this phrase here at the end. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declare the Lord of hosts. So what's Haggai saying right here? These people are building a physical temple. And you know what he tells them? Let's, let's put it in like really modern English. And you guys see this thing? You think that looks good? And they know this thing's terrible. Like, it looks nothing like Solomon's temple, the one that got destroyed. It looks nothing like it. He says, you guys remember the old temple, this former glory? It outshines this piece of rubble by a million, right? 
And, but you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't just come in and go, great job, guys. It sucks, you know? He comes in and he says, but wait a second. Keep working. Because there's coming a day where the latter glory of this house, meaning the temple, is going to be greater than the former. So you think about that. The, 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 the temple that they're looking forward to, the glory of this temple is going to be even greater than the one that Solomon built. Even greater. And as Zechariah pointed out, Gentiles are going to come up and build this thing. And you know what's going to come start streaming into this temple? All the treasure of the nations is going to start coming in. I mean, this thing is going to be grand on a scale that will make Solomon's glory look tiny in comparison. And then we get to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel probably describes the state of this new temple in the greatest detail. I mean, Ezekiel 40 to 48 Go read that. Maybe not right after church. You might fall asleep. But you go read those eight chapters. Eight chapters laying out this grand vision of this new temple. And brethren, here's what you're going to get reading most of it, because I ain't reading all of it. <laughs> you read those eight chapters, and you get this impression where you're just sitting there going, man, what is this thing going to be? I mean, because the impression is he's talking about a new temple that can't be like the old one. I mean, it's going to be so magnificent and so different, and the scale of it is going to be so huge. I mean, it's like incomprehensible to try to imagine what this temple is going to be like. And so let me give you one piece of this, just to give you guys this, this idea that, man, this new thing that they're talking about, even the prophets don't know how to contain all this glory in their language. Their language doesn't even do it justice. So here's what Ezekiel says in part of his vision about this new temple, right? He begins to talk about water that's flowing from the, the base of the altar, and it's flowing out of this temple. Well, brother, let me ask you this question. Was there ever a river flowing from the base of the altar in Solomon's temple out towards the east, out of the temple to all the lands? No. No, thank you. <laughs> it, that never happened. Not a feature of the old one, right? So you, right off the bat, you should know... And this new temple he's talking about, it is not going to be close to Solomon's temple. This thing's going to be totally different. So here's what he says. Ezekiel 47. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, right? So he's showing him this. And behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar. And then he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate that faces towards the east. And behold, the water was trickling out on the south side. Going on eastward with a measuring line in his hand, the man measured a thousand cubits and led me through the water and it was ankle deep. And again, he measured a thousand and led me through the water and it was knee deep. And again, he measured a thousand, led me through the water and it was waist deep. Again, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass through, for the water had risen. It was deep enough to swim in a river that could not be passed through. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? And then he led me back to the bank of the river. And as I went back, I saw on the bank of the river very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said to me, This water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into the Arabah and enters the sea. And when the water flows into the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every living creature that swarms will live. And there will be very many fish. For this water goes there, that the waters of the seas may become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. Fishermen will stand beside the sea. From Engedi to Englame, it will be a place for the spread, spreading of nets. Its fish will be of very many kinds, like the, like the fish of the great sea but its swamps and its marshes will not become fresh, for they are left for salt. And on the banks, on both sides of the river, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month, because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for healing. I'm brethren, you'll read more of that, but you read that and you go, what on earth is he talking about? What kind of temple could this thing kind of be? And brethren, you start to realize this idea that's all throughout the Old Testament. And as the New Testament reveals it, you start to, be, you start to understand this reality. And you start to understand how to read your Bible better. 
Do you think Ezekiel's describing a literal physical temple where there's going to be a fat stream running out of it to where as it starts running outside of the east, it's going to be so vast and so deep nobody can cross it? No. No, right? But what's the point of that? It's not to describe something for you where every single word you read is the literal thing of what it's going to be. Brother, brethren, he's giving you imagery to tell you here's the best way to explain what's going to come about. And it is so grand and it is so awesome and it's so majestic that here's the best way we could describe it. And, and, and you start, I mean, brethren, you read that and you just get this idea. This new temple that has been long awaited for in the Old Testament, its blessing will know greater uh, ends than Solomon's ever could have. Not only is, I mean, because you think about it, brethren, Solomon's was stationary. You know who had to come to that temple? People. People had to actually travel to their, but brethren, people aren't traveling up to this one. Water is flowing out and it's bringing freshing and rehealing. Wherever it goes, wherever it touches, it's doing this kind of thing. And then you think about how Jesus understands this very idea and this very concept of himself. All right, we get this in the New Testament of Jesus says, John chapter 2. Passover, the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now notice where he's doing this too. The, the irony is great. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple with, with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered him, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this. They believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So brethren, where does Jesus make this ultimate connection for us about this new grand temple that's going to be a blessing for all people? It's going to be like a river running out of it, giving life to everything that it touches. Well, Jesus says it's ultimately him. This is ultimately in Christ. Christ becomes the new temple. How can Christ become a new temple? Because brethren, the temple, its significance and, its, and, and the, the importance of its symbol is only for this fact, that that's the place where God dwells. That's the only reason the temple matters. You think about Jesus, brethren, that is God tabernacling, templing among you. And so Jesus says, yeah, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. And they didn't understand. Right? They didn't understand. But he was referring to himself, brethren, because he is the embodiment of the temple. He is the full reality. He is God in his fullness, unmeasured, right there in the flesh as God's temple. So now, brethren, when Paul says that we are being joined together, and we are being joined together up into a holy temple, you can know this now for certain, that what Paul is declaring is now a concrete reality that Jesus has brought about, that the Old Testament was longing for. This long-awaited temple, brethren, guess what? You don't have to wait for it. There's no temple to wait for anymore. We're not waiting in the future for a temple. It came, and it came in the person of Jesus Christ. And now, guess what? You, Gentiles and Jews, united together in one body, are now being joined together, as he says right there, brick upon brick, being built into this structure as a temple of this new temple that was prophesied about in the Old Testament is now being brought to bear in the church through Christ because now you are joined to the true temple of God. And you see how that works. This is how you can be one new man, one new body. This is also, brethren, how you have now become the temple of God which is why we could make such a drastic change to meet in this building last minute. Brethren, God does not dwell in the other building because it's special. Brethren, it's because we as his people are special. This is why we can move on a dime. This is why the church can meet anywhere, anytime, any place around the world, because they, brethren, are the dwelling place of God by the Spirit. 
There is no mark that has to be made. There is no building that has to be put up, brethren. God in the Spirit comes and dwells with His people because they have been united to Christ, and He says, there's my temple. And you know what? That's not it. Not only does He look at us and say, there's my new temple, He goes, man, this temple's expanding throughout the whole world. Why? Because Christians are expanding throughout the whole world. This temple is taking over everything. And brethren, in this temple is connected to that idea. Christ in building it together is making no distinction. There is no outer court of the Gentiles. There is no dividing wall. And there is no veil between the Holy of Holies. Jew and Gentile come in and what matters is Christ. And what matters is, is if you are united to him. That's all that matters. And so brethren, as we look then at these verses and we see these two truths and of what he says, here's how you're no longer stranger and aliens because brethren, guess what? You have been made one new man in the new man, in the new Adam. All the old distinctions are gone. And more than that, you are a new temple in God's name, by God's spirit. So brethren, there's a few quick, short applications here as we close. First, once again, brethren, to be a part of this house is not to be a part of this building. There's no membership card we check at the door, right? It's not Costco. You know, this, this isn't like, man, if I really want to experience the blessings of my membership, I got to go to that building. Guess how you experience the blessings of God? Be around the people. Brethren, this is why we're praying, right? This is why we're praying for all of you all the time, that you would remain around the people of God. Because if you separate yourself from the people, brethren, guess what you've separated yourself from? The presence of God. I mean, it's like Adam of old, out of the garden, out of God's presence, out away from God's people. So brethren, you want to be a part of God's house? You want to be a God, part of God's people? It's solely by means of identifying with Jesus, which means you identify with his body. You identify with his church. That is vital. Identity with the church. And then second, brethren, would be this. Who are now God's people? Because for a long time, and even now, there are competing theologies about who God's people are, right? And, and that was the biggest debate going on in the early church, all the way you get to Acts 15. Who can truly be called a son of God? Who can truly be a part of the people of God? And others were saying, well, you got to get circumcised. And some people today say, well, I mean, you got to do all these things, right? And I mean, some people are saying, are you ethically Jewish? Some people, you know, we go out on the streets, brethren, are you black, right? You're black, you're part of the people of God. You're Jewish, part of the people of God. Brethren, some points in our own Western history, it's like God bless the West and that's God's people. Brethren, the answer to all those things are, is that what makes you God part of God's people? The answer is no. You are not a part of God's people because you're a Jew. You are not a part of God's people because you are black. You are not a part of God's people because you grew up in the Christian West. Brethren, you are a part of God's people because you have identified yourself with the Messiah and you have clung to him in reliance and in trust. And now you identify with him and him alone. That is how you are part of God's people. And brethren, there is this prevalent idea. Brother. Yeah, amen, brother. Thank you very much. Amen. Wonderful. Yeah, praise the Lord. And so, brethren, listen. Th this idea then, and this is the one that floats around in America, is that there's this extra status for being Jewish. God's going to somehow fulfill something extra for you down the road because you're Jewish. And so that God's got this remainder of God's physical people over here, and then God's got his spiritual people over here in the church. And brethren, I'm here to tell you today, not based upon my own authority, but the authority of Ephesians chapter 2, that that is not true. Brethren, that dividing wall did not get reinforced with Christ. It, and it's not going to be reinforced in the future. Christ broke down the dividing wall of hostility forever to be gone. It is abolished. It has been nullified. It has been validated. Not ever to be brought up again. And so, brethren, when you think about, man, who is God's people? Where does God's blessing reside? Well, brethren, don't take pride in yourself. But, brethren, you take pride in Christ. It's in Christ. And don't dare take away the glory from Jesus Christ by locating it in ethnicity or locating it in a special group of people. Brethren, it's located in Christ. And that was nothing that you did. You were a Gentile. You didn't have the hope. So, brethren, don't boast in and being brought now. And guess what? Don't allow someone to boast because they're a Jew. Don't allow someone to boast because there's some ethnic 
race or there's some color of skin. Brethren, you boast in Christ alone. You want to boast, you say, I'm in because I identify with him. And guess what? Black, white, doesn't matter. You identify with him, we all become into him. And so, brethren, we need to remember that. That's who God's people are. And this is why, brethren, when we traveled to Peru, that was some sweet fellowship and time with them because those were our people. <laughs> they called me gringo, but guess what? I was their gringo. I was their people because it doesn't matter. Those, those ethnic lines, they don't matter. What matters is Christ. And brethren, lastly, this relates to both the theological and the historical as if this great shift of the ages. God's new temple is here. Do not get caught up with all the world news that goes on in other places about, oh, maybe this is the time this temple is going to get built. Maybe this is the time this thing's going to go on over here in Israel. Maybe this time's going to go, you know, we're waiting for this end times thing that people have prophesied 7,000 times about and been wrong 7,001 times. Brethren, don't waste your time with that kind of stuff. You be focused on what? Where's God making the building? Out there? Brethren, he's making it among us. So where should our focus and our priority be? Well, brethren, if someone told you, hey, man, I know what God's doing right now, and you were like, well, I really want to serve God, where are you going to go? Well, you're going to go where God is, brethren. You're going to put your focus there. You're going to put your energy there. You're going to put your time there. You're going to put your money there. You're going to put your children there. Brethren, you're going to say, that's where God is. I'm investing my time there, and I'm not going to waste my time out there. And brethren, it may be Israel that you're wasting all your time and your attention. Brethren, it could be things right outside of here in Las Vegas wasting your time and attention on. Brethren, if God is building up this great temple, the great thing of all of history, the new man, the new humanity, the new Adam, you put yourself in that. Because brethren, what good would this truth do to us to go, okay, you know what? We're not looking for some weird thing down in the future. And, we're, and, 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 and so now we could give ourselves to the true thing. But what good would it do us, brethren, to believe these truths, to go, okay, my theology is right. But now you don't do anything. You know where the temple of God is? You know how God's building it and stacking up with bricks? And you ain't busy about going to see if we can get some more bricks to build this thing. Brethren, we want to give ourselves to this thing. We need to know the church through Christ, not because of us, is the house of salvation, this is the great outworking now through the rest of history until Christ comes. This is it. I mean, who wants to be a part of that? Who wants to be a part of the great outworking of all of human history with just a few Christians in this room? Brother, I want to be. And that's what I'm going to give my life to. That's what I'm going to give my family to. That's what I'm going to give the rest of everything that I got in this life to. And you need to say to yourself and us as a church, we're giving ourselves to that and we will not be distracted by the rest. Because, brethren, this is what God has done in Christ for us. This is God's new dwelling place. This is the new man. This is God's new temple. So you be focused upon that. Let's pray.